Hello and welcome. I'm Adi Gal, Editor-in-Chief of the AMA Journal of Ethics. Thank you for joining us for this video edition of Ethics Talk. COVID-19 vaccines have been developed at unprecedented speeds, but the pace of their global availability has been far slower. While intellectual property regimes are meant to spur innovations, how have patent protections of COVID-19 vaccine manufacturers shape domestic and global public health responses to this pandemic? We explored this and other questions with Professor Anna Santos Rutschman from the St. Louis University School of Law. Professor Rutschman, thanks for being a guest on Ethics Talk today. Thank you for having me. So what do you see as the role of intellectual property protections in spurring research and development of vaccines, which many see as a public health good? Mm -hmm. It is a great question. And I, I like to just start by talking about intellectual property um, as a concept, because different people mean different things uh, when they talk about intellectual property. And I think in some of the debates that we've been having in, in the pandemic, you know, keeping the different functions and things that intellectual property does and does not do sometimes gets a little mixed up. And our responses to things that we think is wrong are, are wrong with intellectual property, with innovation regimes might depend on exactly which part of intellectual property we're talking about. Um, you, you talked about IP as an incentives regime, right? We, we do something that the law normally would not do. We are going to restrict competition on goods that will range from, you know, widgets to public health goods, which is how I would define vaccines. Law tends not to allow this to happen in the first place, but now we encourage this because we think this is necessary um, as an incentive to, to innovation. In that sense, if you're thinking of IP as a set of, of incentives, I think it's a really poor fit for goods like vaccines. Vaccines are not the only types of goods that pose problems when we try to commodify them like this and say, this is going to be a market dependent model and the first to market gets for almost up to 20 years in practice to be the only one okay who competes in, in this area. So that, that's part of the problem we have, right? And it's not a COVID specific problem. It's a problem that derives from the fact that pretty much this is how the majority of vaccines we produce at this point are subject to this model, which is a market-based model. Public health never fares very, very well when you have a lot of predominantly private sector actors operating um, this way. So we're not faring particularly well um, there. We have not been faring, I think, particularly well there for, for decades now. That being um, said, um, is intellectual property the major hurdle in, um, in, in the COVID-19 pandemic? I think it informs a lot of what's happening, but ultimately um, the real barrier is more on the contracts side of um, things. The people get to negotiate these contracts, the companies and the governments involved. Obviously they play the game the way they do because there's an IP informed background, but IP should not stand in the way of fair allocation of vaccines, uh, of lessening competition um, standards or, or ethos during during the pandemic. That That's not IP necessarily at work. IP has contributed to the framework, but this is how we pretty much subject vaccine production and distribution to standard contracts. That That's where we stand. And I think that's where most of the trouble is coming from. So given what you just said, publicly funded research into messenger RNA was critical in, develop, in, the, in the development of currently available COVID-19 vaccines. So how should, intellectually, how should intellectual property inform contracts be structured to avoid socializing costs and privatizing benefits of vaccines? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that the problem here is that current practices are different from IP as I see it in the books, right? The black letter of, of the law. We can disagree with the principle that some goods should be subject to incentive regimes that are structured around IP, that's one thing. But once we've collectively decided to, to make that decision and say this is the regime in place, there were 
several safeguards that were built into the law and, and said, in some circumstances, we're going to limit the reach of proprietary rights. And I think that in theory, we have that framework in place, and that should speak to things like public funding having gone into the development of critical components of some of these vaccines. But wh whenever you have public uh, funding accounting for a lot of what is happening at the development level, the law does a number of, of, different, uh, of different things. Uh, and these are not the only IP protections, but the ones that are relevant uh, in, in the case of, uh, of publicly funded uh, inventions. It says that the funding agencies have certain rights when it comes um, to using or deciding what can be done with, with the invention, which in this case is going to be uh, a particular type of, um, of vaccine. In the case of Moderna, for instance, uh, it seems that it, in addition to, to public uh, funding for, uh, for the R&D, we're also talking about such degree of involvement of uh, work uh, on part of public sector uh, scientists that the question of co-ownership of, of the vaccine also came into, into play. So you might have a situation of co-ownership and then it's pretty much like, you know, when you own something like a house and there's more than one person and it's not that everybody has only 50% of the house, you get to control the entire house. You have to bargain, but you control the entirety of, of the goods. So the law is accounted for situations of co-ownership in which one of the parties, one of the co-owners can be the government. And then the government has broad leeway to do a number of things that our governments have typically not done, set pricing ceilings, right? authorize uh, manufacturing by others um, that would you know, increase the amount of, of vaccine available to everybody. This is not um, as easy to do as it might sound, but it's a possibility that the law contemplates. And in the case of transfers of technology from the public sector to the private sector, the funding agency retains what we call a marching uh, right, meaning that if there's a public health um, crisis, that agency should have the ability in order to satisfy the public interest to say, well, we're going to allow somebody else to step in and manufacture this product. As I said, this exists in the legal framework. So IP theory is, I think working, what's not working is IP practice. And unfortunately, it's not just during COVID. We've never ever have um, had a, a march in right that was successful in the history of the, of the US. And we've talked about oncology drugs. Now we're talking about potentially vaccines. We've talked about administrations leaning more to the right, more to the left, you name it. We've never had a, a successful march in right. So the protections exist in practice, uh, in theory. In practice, however, things are very, very different. So given what you just said about the distinction between theory and practice, one of the things the federal government did was through Operation Warp Speed, expedited production and availability of COVID-19 investigational vaccines by having the US federal government finance much of the manufacturing ramp up costs before the vaccines were authorized for emergency use by the FDA. Uh, what intellectual property considerations have or should have been incorporated in this public-private partnership? Um, so this idea that the government plays a fundamental role in helping even the private sector bring uh, products to, to market makes a lot of sense, particularly now, right? You know, in, in the mid-20th century, you would have a lot of basic R&D, and you still do to, to some extent, but occurring in the, in, the, in the public sector, but funding for that has decreased. So these collaborations are crucial. That being said, that does not mean that we should necessarily think that because we are much more dependent now on, on the private sector than, than we were back in the day, that contracts, and that this is why I really think this is all about licensure and, and contracts really and how poor a fit current licensing and contractual frameworks are IP and beyond uh, IP. It doesn't mean that things need to be necessarily tilting towards the protection of the interests or the exclusive rights of just one of, of the players, which would be in this in, in this case the companies that do manufacture um, these vaccines. And and I cannot um, you know understate I don't want to understate the role that they they play. Well, without them, we would not uh, have uh, the the vaccine doses that we have today, insufficient as they are for the the tremendous public health. Uh, need. That being said, that does not mean that the contracts should not contemplate things like allocation of um, vaccines of 
patented uh, or potentially patented vaccines just because they are patented that does not mean that we cannot contractual agree to certain patterns of, uh, of allocation it does not mean that we cannot ex ante before the need actually arises account for things like the need to have other companies that normally you would not cooperate with as a an individual, um, highly competitive private sector a company, but just account for the fact that we are facing, we're likely to face, and we knew that, massive um, scarcity. So all of this can and should be incorporated into these contracts. Part of them are licensure contracts, saying this is patent technology, this is how we're going to transfer it. Uh, some of these other concerns are not directly related to patents, but have to do with affordability of vaccines. When do you start sending doses to populations sorely in need outside um, the US. The contracts typically don't talk about this, don't talk about affordability of vaccines. We don't have a problem now, but we could, right? The position of the sure. administration was that we cannot control the prices of vaccines, which is not accurate from the legally from the perspective of the ability. You can, you choose not to for certain uh, reasons, but you can. Contracts though do not cover um, these kinds of, of scenarios. And that's what I see as very problematic. Just because something is patented, it has never meant, no court has ever said that con control was absolute. Pretty much as control of your house is not absolute. And we impose a number of restrictions on, on you that range from sometimes letting you, you know, le letting certain companies walk over your property. And sometimes we take, we pay, but we take your property away uh, from you. And intellectual property in that regard works the same, except in practice tends not to. So given uh, what you just said, vaccine nationalism has been used to describe countries, usually in the global north, securing vaccines for their own populations at detriment to countries in the global south. What should we appreciate about how patent protections and IP uh, exacerbating longstanding global health inequity? I think they are a contributing uh, factor indirectly because what intellectual property is about is saying you get a property like right over a particular good. And we apply that across the, the board, making no distinction. There, there are very few things we say, oh, you cannot patent uh, that. Conceptually, th there's very few things that we uh, say this is excluded. So most um, health innovations that we're familiar with and we'll need throughout a pandemic from PPP equipment to, you know, respirator valves to vaccines, treatments, you name it, all of it is potentially patentable. What IP does is to say for up to 20 um, years, nominally 20 years, this owner, this company, this person, this institution is going to be the only one controlling any aspects related to this technology, absent some intervention like the ones we've discussed, the state, the government, the agency decides to do, to do something. So if this is the, the default, IP is giving these uh, entities this very limited number of players enormous power over anything that's done with the protected technology, including who you're going to sell it to or provide it um, to. And what we're seeing is that this aspect of IP, which we've always known about, this is how the system was um, structured. We know that this needs to be coupled with other considerations, particularly when we stop talk about stop talking about shares or steel, and you talk about health um, health goods. And things get even more critical when we get to the type of health good that we're discussing um, today, which really is something that's needed to respond to a global public health problem. So. What IP is indirectly enabling us to do is to have then contracts on distribution pre-orders because that's how vaccine nationalism has been operationalized. What IP has enabled is a scenario in which whoever controls the IP can either start a contractual relationship or agree to one in which we say, and these vaccines go to US citizens or whoever is living in, in the United um, States. So what is missing is either within IP, but also within international uh, law, contractual uh, frameworks, a mechanism that says, hold on, there are particular types of goods that it doesn't make sense if we just allocate them based on jurisdictions, right? Because IP controls what happens in um, in the US, but we're essentially saying, and now the contracts that you as the IP on your get to, uh, to get into, you also get to provide just um, the goods for this market. So this is what's missing. There's no legal provision, there's no treaty, there's no law or case that I'm aware uh, of that would say, hold on a moment, it's a global public health problem. We need a more centralized solution. You can engage into those, but that's all voluntary. And a lot of um, the 
the companies and, and governments have not been participating in these. So given that, um, to promote global health equity, what do you see as the most compelling changes to uh, intellectual property law that would promote better international collaboration in vaccine development and distribution? So I think there's a couple of things that we do on a smaller scale already that we should definitely do on a much, much um, bigger um, scale because nationalism is not new. We, this happened in, in the previous pandemic and with swine flu in 2009, it happened throughout the 20th um, century uh, in different forms, just with vaccines. Uh, so we, we know this is bound to happen again. The immediate answer that we saw during COVID, which I think um, is, uh, it's definitely a step in the right direction, but just not enough, was the formation of COVAX, which pretty much functions as a procurement um, institution, pretty much like Gavi already does for childhood uh, vaccines, and pretty much flips the skim on its head by saying, oh, these pre-purchase um, or pre-production agreements that we uh, have, we are just going to use those and then put some strings, attach some strings when it comes to allocation and try to start allocating vaccines on a more uh, global uh, level. This is a very small effort, again, incredibly uh, important, but obviously during the pandemic, you can't ramp up such a collaborative um, scale, you know, like, like this. So I think that what we can do on the IP side of things is to not redesign the system. I would love to have a system that's redesigned, but if I were to say, you know, vaccines need to be treated in particular ways that will subtract the amount of IP protection we give to them, much as I would like to have this, there's an international treaty called TRIPS and Article 27 is going to say you cannot treat different types of technology differently. They all get the same type of patent protection. So ideally, I would like to actually tinker with something uh, along those lines, but this is going to realistically need a lot of international agreement on a, a very divisive topic. So here's what we can do. We can say, okay, we know that some countries, and at this point with the US back into uh, international um, cooperation um, frameworks, we know that a majority, a large majority of countries does like something like COVAX. It's underfunded, right? It's uh, it, it's smaller than we would like it um, to be, but we know the next pandemic is coming. We even have from the WHO lists of potential pathogens um, that are likely to cause uh, viral families and the like that are li likely to cause uh, upcoming pandemics. We can do things like patent pools. We can do things like patent um, pledges and we can have COVAX-like um, structures in place. What I mean by this is to say we can have companies, institutions, governments pledging, pledging certain types of technology that everybody will be able to use, you know, after they pay a, a fee, should there be another pandemic. So the moment the next pandemic or a large public health crisis is declared, we can have just a pool of technology ready to go. And there's no back and forth. Can I do this? Will you allow me to, to use your technology? How much do I need to pay? We can solve those questions, those bargaining questions in, in advance. And it's up to the patent owners to pull or to pledge their technology. This also happened during um, um, during COVID. Uh, a couple of law professors, uh, Professor Lemley and Contreras, um, actually worked on with, with a few other lawyers on a pledge for COVID-19 technology. It's a really great initiative. I would like to see more vaccine technology going into that pool. And I think after this pandemic starts, you know, hopefully soon um, to, to come to an end, this would be the right time for us to start populating a pledge, to start creating a pool of technology that you just know how much you're going to pay and, and license the technology you need to produce the next vaccine, but also treatments and, and other things. So I think we can do this with an IP. We can scale up um, COVAX, make it permanent because it's not, right? It's a remedial um, structure. And these would be modest um, steps and we would be marginally better and we would have less nationalistic approaches come the next pandemic. Um, well, on that note, I want to thank uh, Professor Rutschman for sharing her insight and expertise with our audience today. Professor Rutschman, thanks again for being a guest on Ethics Talk. Thank you again. For more COVID ethics resources, please visit the AMA Journal of Ethics at journalofethics.org. Thank you for being with us today. We'll see you next time on Ethics Talk. <laughs>